Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. It's a daunting series of questions that I've been asked to address in 25 minutes. So uh, I'm going to fly through them uh, and I'm out of order, that is, I pick the sort of the thing I'm not expert on, and therefore I can answer fairly quickly, uh, in a fairly ignorant way. Is that what's the role of faith, uh, religious faith, in promoting altruism? And uh, that's a big question. There are people who work on it. I don't work on this. I do know that uh, in the U.S., people who are more religious, uh, when you operationalize it in terms of uh, how often they t attend religious services, go to church or temple, uh, and so on. Uh, are more charitable. Uh, they give a larger share of their incomes and the kind of charity that they do also uh, goes more directly to alleviating suffering as opposed to, say, uh, the local opera company. Um, so, and the same thing applies to more conservative people are also more charitable. Um, anyway, but so just as an anthropologist, I should note, however, that uh, does this, you know, uh, this is a statistic which comes from the United States, and one might doubt that it, it generalizes to all religions, um, so that the Aztecs who believed that their gods needed blood and uh, sacrificed large numbers of war captives you know, uh, all the time, uh, you know, maybe the more religious an Aztec you are, maybe you might not be more charitable, I don't know. Or there was you know, the Kali death worshippers in India, and the, the thuggies and, uh, you know, uh, where you might ritually kill uh, travelers on the road and rob them. Um, anyway, and there's also the difficulty of separating cause and effect. Maybe more charitable people are more likely to become more religious uh, or to attend church more often or something. So uh, those questions are extremely difficult. Uh, the question said, what is the role of faith, religious and otherwise, in promoting altruism? Uh, so... Uh, uh, so what would non-religious faith be? And I think uh, that you can make sense of that kind of thing, that people, uh, one kind of thing that people say about faith, uh, rationalists uh, like me are prone to say things like, well, you should look for evidence, and faith is, you know, uh, that means you are expecting something without evidence. And uh, uh, on the other hand, within the realm of uh, how natural selection acts on uh, a psychology of altruism. Uh, uh, humans look very much like they are contingent cooperators. So if they expect they're in a social environment where other people are not going to be, where other people are going to be exploiting them uh, and not helping them in return, then they're much less likely to be helpful. So if, if you define non-religious faith uh, uh, as the expectation the world will be in a particular way, especially an expectation the world will, by and large, the social ecology you're in will appreciate and reciprocate uh, sacrifices on behalf of others, then you're more likely to make them. The question about what's the impact or importance of worldview and how I interpret the findings of science, that's a hard question. Uh, I'm not entirely sure I understand uh, what the question is, but uh, I can just say a few things about my worldview because it's had a lot of impact on what I've done with my life. And the first thing is that uh, my older brother brought back Thomas Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions when I was in high school. And I read it and I thought it was really interesting. And uh, one thing Kuhn argued was that uh, people tend to uh, ignore data that's inconsistent with their theories. Um, and that so uh, there are particular periods of time when the amount of data which is inconsistent gets so large that it causes some kind of crisis and then people start to try to come up with a new theory that can accommodate the new data. And so I, I thought that the lesson of that is that you should pay attention to anomalies as well as consistencies uh, because, and then I, as I got more sophisticated in the academic world, I also noticed that uh, scientists don't cease being human beings and human beings form groups which have uh, uh, belief systems which they want their in-group members to adopt. And so uh, there's really 
scientists are less than ideal in looking at or detecting anomalies in what they think, and I'm sure I'm just like other people in, in respect to that. But at least I think that, that you know, it's still the ideal to try to bring no presuppositions to what you do, and I hope, uh, almost certainly erroneously, that uh, what I think is the result of the data that I see uh, and the logic of the arguments and not just my uh, worldview. Uh, but insofar as I have a worldview, it's a very standard uh, worldview, which is uh, I uh, like enlightenment values of reason and subjecting uh, one's belief systems uh, to the tests of uh, you know, a logic and evidence. Um, I do think uh, that diversity of views is inherently valuable because the world is extremely complicated. And so uh, if everybody just has a single majority belief, even if it's a pretty correct belief like Newtonian gravitation or something like that, still that will lead you to overlook uh, things that, uh, that the social community, if there's a diversity of views, uh, uh, will discover things uh, that a much more a world in which there's much more enforced conformity will not. So you might think of this as the Columbus effect. So uh, the leading intellects of Europe uh, knew quite well that the world was round. And they also knew since the ancient Greeks had computed it that the world was, you know, on the rough order of 20,000, mi 4,000 miles around. And that uh, therefore uh, Asia was incredibly far away, much further than what you could make in an ordinary sailing trip. And uh, so Columbus, uh, in fact, had an incorrect view and uh, thought the world was smaller and thought that Asia was closer. And so by sailing on his belief, his diverse view, uh, he ran into the new world and he made a discovery that all the people who were more correct uh, about the size of the world didn't make. So diversity is good. Uh, and again, with, in this forum, uh, I thought I should mention that as a, as a young child, I was raised uh, without much... Uh, pressure uh, as, a, as a Christian. My mother dropped me off at church, uh, and, uh, but uh, in elementary school I became interested in science, uh, especially physics and astronomy, and I really gravitated towards detailed and principled causal explanations for things. Um, and that's what really appeals to me rather than a worldview, it's a kind of taste, a taste for thinking things where I understand the, the reasons for I ground the reasons in observations and in a general kind of logic. Uh, and that in general, scientific explanations seem to have this property of meshing far more tightly with observations and events than uh, many other kinds of things. And so uh, that's not to say uh, I was really eager to not be, to become unreligious, but uh, uh, I thought it was kind of sad uh, that the universe, that a 10, you know, 14 billion year old pitiless material universe uh, with disease and catastrophe and entropy and uh, uh, the endless slaughter of history, it seemed then, and it seems to me now, tragic. But I also think it's better to face reality uh, insofar as we can perceive it. Um, and so uh, here we are. And so, but, but this does, you know, this forum is, I think, an expression of uh, an issue, which is that people perceive that there's a kind of slow motion civilizational crisis that the world that science reveals to us is, uh, you know, it's a strange, uh, largely hostile and alien landscape. And our traditions, whether religious or humanistic, really don't prepare us mentally to live in this world. Um, and so we don't, have a, we don't have institutions or ways of thinking or ways of feeling which really are uh, close the, the gap between what we see in, in the scientific world and... and uh, uh, and what our present cultural traditions support. And I don't have anything to offer there. I'm as lost as everyone else. So uh, I just have this general enlightenment scientific faith that it's better to know what's true, okay? And so what do I mean by all this? That, that okay, so uh, to start out talking about altruism, I really want to underline something basic, which is that we live in a universe where altruism is an extremely rare phenomenon that requires special explanation uh, that, uh, and I'm going to start with a, a particular case of uh, there's a, a, a kind of monkey, Langer, a Hanuman Langers, that uh, live in India. And uh, there's uh, natural selection has built a particular set of adaptations in the minds of 
male uh, langurs, and this causes them to do something highly specific. That is, they live in groups with a uh, group of females and one resident male, and that resident male uh, took over uh, the group by driving out the previous resident male, uh, and he fights off and keeps distant other males so that they don't mate with the females in the group. Um, and a second kind of thing is for, for birth spacing. Resources are finite for uh, langurs, and uh, um, so the mothers have to space out their offspring, and they can't have a nurse more than one offspring at a time. So while they're nursing, this causes, uh, there's a, whole, a feedback loop which causes uh, infertility uh, while they're nursing. And then when they stop nursing, uh, when they wean the offspring, um, then they uh, start cycling again, they start ovulating again and can be impregnated. Um, so um, uh, this interesting phenomenon happens that when a, a new male drives out the old male who has been fathering the offspring, uh, for you know, the last two or three or four years, uh, uh, he goes around, the new male goes around and he kills all the unweaned infants, uh, but not the weaned infants, okay? Uh, and he continues to kill newborn infants uh, for a certain period of time that corresponds to the length of time uh, that, uh, uh, of pregnancy. So that all the females who are pregnant by the preceding male, he kills the infants that come out then. But when, but when infants uh, sired by him start to appear, he does not kill those, okay? So what do we make of this strange behavior, okay? Uh, and now before I, I talk about what it treats, I just sort of want to take a step back about natural selection and what we're talking about in terms of this. That is, uh, natural selection is, I would argue, an amoral physical process. So not unlike other kinds of physical processes that do sorting. So if you go off the coast here to San Miguel Island, when Cabrillo came along, he put uh, uh, goats, uh, maybe it was pigs, I'm now forgetting, but I think goats on the island, so that when he came back, he would uh, they multiply and he would have meat, uh, and the goats uh, ate off. Uh, there's really high winds on San Miguel, uh, typically, and what that did is uh, the goats uh, took off enough grass that erosion started and it's cleaned off almost a very large proportion of the island. And so what happens is the wind comes along and it picks up uh, heavy objects and it moves them a short distance and slightly lighter objects, it moves them a further distance and lighter objects, it moves them even further. So the whole island is sorted in, with gradient, okay? Um, and that's just a physical sorting process. Or when the earth was formed, uh, gravity uh, various uh, clumps of matter collided together, uh, caused heat, and the heavier elements sank towards the center, so you have nickel iron in the center, and the lighter things like silicon and aluminum, and so on, oxygen, or not oxygen, uh, gases and so on, uh, ended up more towards the surface. Um, and so again, you have a sorting process, um, and uh, uh, so natural selection is a sorting process that if you have physical systems that make copies of themselves and entropy introduces random variants into that population, the ones which uh, have designs which interact with the world in such a way that they have more offspring, uh, make more copies of themselves, they become more common. So natural selection, uh, mechanically variation happens because copying is not perfect. Uh, those changes which interfere with reproduction, they disappear. They take themselves out of the population. Those changes which, those rare changes which make an improvement in reproduction, then it's almost a tautology. They spread. They make themselves more and more and more frequent. And then the species is better designed than it was before. That is, it does better design for reproduction. So there is nothing about this process which is good or which is guaranteed to produce something that we would like or approve of. It's the only force in the physical world which, uh, aside from intelligence, intelligent planning, which is capable of producing well-organized, highly functional uh, uh, systems, okay? Um, and so it's the only anti-entropic force which pushes things uphill to, but only in a certain way, towards better organization for reproduction. Um, okay.
So that was a pause while we talked about natural selection. Now we're back from a natural selection perspective of why do Langer males, lion males also, various rodents do this, it's not limited to Langer's, why do they kill the infants, okay, when the new male takes over a local area? Well, when he kills the infant, uh, the infant no longer nurses, the mother no, no longer has to produce milk, the feedback loop stops, and the mother becomes uh, fertile again. Okay, then the male mates with the female. That sounds horrible, right? It's a nightmare world, right? Uh, uh, and, but it's a real world, right? Um, that uh, the female becomes uh, fertile, the male impregnates her, the male now has an offspring with this female. And, well, why not wait until the offspring is weaned? Well, the male has a finite window. He's only going to be there for, you know, two or three or four years. And sooner or later, he's going to get sick or he's going to get old, and some other male will drive him out. Okay. So if he has to wait around the whole period while these infants are being nursed, that's a, lo a large window of lost reproduction. So we don't know exactly how the the neural program in the Langer male brain is organized, but it's something like, gee, aren't infants, when I take over a troop, aren't they just, aren't nursing infants really obnoxious, okay? Don't I want them dead, okay? And obviously it's not exactly like that, I'm just saying there's some program in the head which motivates malevolence towards the infants. It's not in the interest of the infants to die, right? It's not in the interest of the mothers. The mothers uh, don't, they resist it, they try to fend off, but the males are bigger, and it takes, uh, but mothers and their mother's sisters and so on will all try to cooperate to protect the infant, but sooner or later, in general, the male is successful uh, and is able to do some kind of moral wound on the infant, okay? So there's this period of conflict. It's not in the mother's interest. It's not in the uh, previous male's interest. His infants are being killed. It's uh, not in the infant's interest to die. It's only, and it's a very, what it is is we could say it's in the male's interest because he's now having more offspring. And if you say, that's a kind of metaphorical way of thinking about it. It's just a positive feedback loop. That is, males with that design leave more copies of that design, okay? And that's not, uh, there's no ordinary human meaning in that, okay? That's just positive feedback. It's a kind of sorting process of different design features caused by reproduction to make some more frequent and others less frequent. And in this case, it's a pretty nasty, unpleasant thing that's made part of the standard design of Langer males, okay? Uh, there's lots of things like that. So there are, uh, uh, when you see uh, baby chicks on the ground, in general, it's because their larger siblings in the nest threw them out of the nest, so they had more of the food that the mother was bringing back. It's siblicide, okay? Um, and you have, uh, uh, Unungulates in the uterus, uh, some of them, uh, if one is on the top of the other, uh, the horn tissue will start to grow. It will impale their sibling, kill it, then they have more of the resources of the uterus, and they'll reabsorb their horn in time to be born. Okay. Um, so, and those work because uh, they leave more copy, that particular design leaves more copies of itself. Um, okay. So then, with that kind of sobering background, then we ask, well, in general, uh, you know, rocks are not altruistic to other rocks. Uh, most organisms are not altruistic to most other organisms. But there is the, the good news, uh, as far as there is good news in this perspective, is that uh, there are some islands, there are some, some kinds of selection pressures which select for altruism, for uh, sacrificing on behalf of another. Um, but there are fairly narrow envelopes of conditions. So we're, from an evolutionary perspective, one wants to explain properties and how they have been ratcheted up by natural selection. And so there's a number of different theories, uh, too many to go into now, uh, of how different types of altruism appear under different kinds of circumstances. So there's some small but real, real islands of altruism, that is, how natural selection builds uh, adaptations, neural programs, things in us by design to help others, okay? Um, but that's against the background of, of uh, a living world in which uh, there's a huge amount of indifference and a huge amount of exploitation. So predators love to eat prey. They don't, that's how they love prey, for example. So for humans, 
we're intensely aware of, uh, you know, we seek, we value being valued ourselves. We also value certain other people. Um, and uh, the, the question is, does evolutionary biology explain uh, the altruism that we see? Okay, and, uh, and I just want to say in comparison, you know, you could say, well, does not worrying about the differences between Newton and Einstein for a moment, does Newtonian uh, gravitational mechanics, does that explain what we see in the solar system? And where things are really simple, like the orbits of planets, it does a really good job, okay? Where you look at something like uh, the rings of Saturn and the complex braidings that people have found or the turbulence of gas in, in Jupiter, we think in principle that, that the physics we know explains that, but it's too complicated for us to really know. So we look in fine textured ways about these theories of altruism and we see whether we can show evidence that there is brain organism, there, that there is uh, psychological mechanisms or neural programs which follow these rules that conform to these selection pressures. And to a first approximation, it looks like in principle where we have looked, which is not at all different phenomena, but at the phenomena we look at, there does seem to be a heavy and specific signature of the selection pressure is reflecting these kinds of things. So I'll, I'll just make a, a big claim that uh, it looks as if we all have a neural system which uh, is designed to put a certain amount of weight on the welfare of specific other people. So some people we put a lot of weight on their welfare, our children, our, our, our spouses or lovers, um, and other people we put no weight on and other people we even put negative weight on. We take pleasure in the harm we can do. Some humans do that. Okay. Um, okay. And then uh, the other kind of thing I want to say just in terms of how specific does it get, I, I don't have time to say much more about welfare trade-off ratios except that it seems to play a role at the center of a series of emotions like uh, a gratitude is somebody's put more weight on your welfare than you had expected and to stabilize that relationship in a natural selection sense that means your mind then to recalibrate so you have this feeling and the feeling recalibrate turns upward the amount of weight you put on this other person's welfare. You appreciate them more, okay? With anger being a kind of mirror image of that. Uh, and, uh, but then I also wanna talk about another, here, here's something where we have a lot of specific data, um, which is uh, there's a theory of altruism called kin selection theory and there uh, a gene not only increases its frequency in the next generation by uh, increasing the reproduction of the individual it's in, if it can increase the reproduction of another individual uh, that, that has some probability of carrying that same gene, then it might also increase in frequency. So the theory of kin selection describes the conditions under which uh, organisms should be selected to trade off their own reproduction in order to increase the reproduction of another individual, okay? That requires knowing who, and what do we call these individuals who are more likely to carry genes? Those are genetic relatives, okay? So built into the structure of natural selection is the prediction that organisms uh, that are getting reliable information about relatedness ought to treat those individuals as special in some way, as, as more likely to, uh, as the system ought to put more weight on their welfare than other people, uh, okay, other things being equal. So we looked at this in terms of, for hunter-gatherers, what would have been sources of information about relatedness? And uh, uh, there are two cues that we uh, both predicted and found. And one was, uh, uh, if you see uh, your mother give birth to and take care of a neonate, well, that's going to be your sibling, okay? That's a really reliable cue that that's a genetic relative, okay? Uh, on the other hand, if you're a younger sibling, you weren't around when your mother gave birth, so you can't have seen uh, your older sibling be born and being taken care of as a newborn. Uh, so you need a different cue about who's related. And uh, hunter-gatherers, they forage, they, people stay with their mothers in particular, their parents, children do. And so the more often you are with a person, the more likely you are to be related to that person, okay? And so from ages zero to somewhere around 16, 18, it looks as if there is a mechanism in the mind that just says, am I with this person now? Am I with this person now? Am I with, and it sums those things up. And for people they are with a lot, they, there's the, we call it just arbitrary terminology, but the kinship index, the kinship index is high, that 
that's a magnitude which, which reflects the probability that that person's a close genetic relative. Uh, and the same uh, thing with uh, the uh, maternal perinatal association. That means around birth mother, around birth association, okay? That's monitored too. Okay? And those two cues are integrated and produces this variable in the head. And then that variable, uh, so there's two reasons why organisms need to know their genetic relatives. One is to uh, uh, place more weight on their welfare. Uh, that would be favored by natural selection. Uh, and the other reason is you need to avoid having sex with them because uh, genes that are, that are recessive uh, will express themselves and the children will be less healthy. They will be, have various genetic diseases that manifest themselves. So the same, so two different mechanisms, who am I sexually attracted to and who should I care more for, okay, are both going to need the same information about who's a relative. And if you test this out, it turns out that, uh, so the idea is that this system uh, looks at cues of genetic relatedness and in our subject population, those people who are exposed to their mother taking care of their sibling, uh, they find uh, having sex with those people, uh, the idea of having sex with those people much more disgusting and also they care more about their welfare uh, than people who didn't have that cue. Or in the absence of that cue, uh, the longer you co-reside with a sibling, the more disgusting you find sexual contact with such a person and also the more you, um, uh, the more you put weight on their welfare, the more likely you are to donate a kidney, the more likely you are to uh, keep in touch with them or to do them favors or loan them money and so on. Okay, so, uh, and they, so that's, that would be altruism, welfare trade-off. So the higher the, the, your brain registers the kinship of this person to you, the more they're likely to be a genetic relative, the more you put weight on their welfare and the more you avoid having sex with them. Okay. Two minutes. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm that, I raced ahead to be done. Okay, so uh, that's basically, I just wanted to get through that, that there's, I will spare you the sort of data analysis, but that, uh, uh, so there's these various theories about how natural selection, what positive feed, what, what trait will cause positive feedback on itself, uh, which involves altruism towards others. So the, one of the primary ones is this kin selection system. Uh, Others uh, involve uh, reciprocity. I put weight on your welfare, um, and you, uh, you know, you put weight on my welfare. The system reinforces itself. That's a kind of that's another kind of pathway in which self-sacrifice can occur. Um, and there's some other theories as well. But anyway, these all have fairly narrow conditions, and it looks as if the mind uh, is sensitive to the cues that oh yes, this is a context in which. Uh, Altru that activate these instincts, okay? These instincts were shaped by these selection pressures and they organize our behavior. And then I just wanted to say that n there, is al there is many other possible routes to altruism, um, including not everything is the result of natural selection. Uh, so natural selection is what organizes uh, and creates sort of species typical design, uh, but there are byproducts. So there's lots of features of organisms which are uh, uh, there because they're linked to things which are adaptive but are not themselves, but not there because they were uh, selected for specifically. So this is a kind of, uh, so um, there's this chilly world of non-altruism and then there are these fairly narrow pathways by which uh, altruism shapes, by which selection pressure shape the human mind so that it's organized to be altruistic. Um, and that's a certain thing. Okay. It's great to be with you um, talking about one of the most uh, fascinating topics in over the last generation in the biosciences, uh, altruism. Uh, this issue was uh, put on the table uh, in an explicit and more popular way um, now 35 years ago by Ewa Wilson in his landmark volume, uh, Sociobiology. And uh, Wilson claimed that the altruism was the central pro theoretical problem of sociobiology, which he defined as the application of evolutionary theory to social behavior. Now, why is it the central theoretical problem? 
because um, in Wilson's word, uh, altruism, which by definition reduces uh, personal fitness, how could this possibly evolve by natural selection? And uh, this is not only a central theoretical issue for the sciences, uh, th which hold continuity between, uh, this is, by the way, Jane Goodall uh, communing uh, with uh, a great ape, uh, but they're also central for most religious traditions, and particularly the Christian tradition, uh, which views uh, humanity, uh, human nature, as in some way equipped uh, to not only do, but be fulfilled by uh, altruism. Uh, this is the Good Samaritan by Rembrandt, and this is one of the themes that uh, it, it dominates uh, much of Western art, one of my favorites, uh, Van Gogh. And th there's an apparent tension here between uh, scientific uh, enterprise, which says, well, how could such a thing uh, come about? Many advocates of evolutionary theory and even uh, argue that it doesn't come about and that any conviction that altruism is real is a deception uh, versus a dis uh, tradition that says it's not only real but central to what it means to be uh, humans. And this, this has caused many people to think of um, evolutionary theory and religious faith, in particular the Christian faith, as being intrinsically at odds. Um, I don't want to sidestep um, t intellectual tensions here, but I, I actually don't think they are intrinsically at odds. And this tension between uh, how we view the world as essentially hospitable or inhospitable to altruism is not fundamentally a religion versus uh, irreligion tension at all. Uh, but it may, uh, it may reflect a deeper tension in, in all of our experience with reality. In fact, one of my favorite treatments of this is from... Alfred Lord Tennyson's famous poem, In Memoriam, which was written around the time of Darwin, but before he published The Origin of Species. In that poem, uh, Tennyson wrestled, and actually it took him 16 years to write this. He started it when he was a college student, about your age, um, or just after college, when his uh, best friend uh, died an untimely death. And Tennyson, uh, this famous line, Nature Red in Tooth and Claw, comes from this poem, but Tennyson wrestles with how could uh, nature... Uh, reflect uh, the existence of a good God and he says uh, of humans who trusted God was love indeed and love creation's final law though nature read in tooth and claw with raven shrieked against this creed. So at this point uh, I want to reiterate the four questions that I'll be addressing as well. Science and worldview, how does evolution uh, account for altruism? What about human uniqueness and finally altruism and faith and I'll, I'll do them in that order um, and, and start with a pretty heavy emphasis on that, that first issue, since this is a Veritas forum. Um, science and worldview can interact in, in a couple of pri many ways, but uh, two primary ways. And, and one of those ways is for science um, to inform worldview. And in fact, uh, for science to attempt to be used to demonstrate or prove certain aspects of worldview. When it's done in religion, it's called natural theology. That's uh, a historic enterprise. You could also do natural atheology, uh, use science to disprove the existence of God. And the enterprise looks something like this. Let's say uh, your dog is out digging uh, in the ground and lo and behold, um, he finds treasure and you say, aha, there must be pirates here. And um, natural theology kind of uses science to dig and then uh, infers metaphysical conclu conclusions from whatever it digs up. Now, there are a couple of ways of doing this. There's a, there's a modest way of doing this, which just says this. The character of natural regularities are consonant or maybe inconsonant with God's endowment. So um, Newton made the comment that this most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets can only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent being whom I call the Lord God. And since Newton, we've actually looked at uh, the value of the gravitational constant or the very, very precisely fine-tuned value of the initial mass density of the universe. And to many people, uh, it looks like the universe reflects, but it's the natural regularities of the universe that reflect uh, the existence of an intelligent creator. Fred Hoyle, who actually never became a theist, um, says a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect is monkeyed with physics as well as chemistry uh, and biology. But I'm actually not here to argue for this. I just want, want to give this as an example. And there, there are arguments against this. In fact, you could do natural atheology. So my colleague in evolutionary biology, Richard Dawkins, says the universe has precisely those properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. 
There's a bolder version of this. The bolder version of this is to say uh, that, God, that gaps in the natural regularities demonstrate God's presence and intervention. Not the regularities themselves, but their inadequacy. So the intelligent design movement is one contemporary example of this. Uh, my colleague Bill Dembski says, if biologists cannot specify in detail how organisms came about by natural processes, then perhaps they came about by a supernatural assembler. Well, perhaps they did. Uh, one argument against this point of view, and by the way, this is not only a, a, a scientific argument, but it's a theological argument. Many people argue that this represents a God of the gaps theology, which locates our confidence in the existence of God in terms of what we don't understand, so that as the uh, domain of what we understand increases, our confidence in God decreases. If, um, if you're a Christian here today, and I, this audience is composed of both non-Christians and Christians, I hope, and I hope I'm speaking to each, um, but there are other grounds for belief in God besides uh, anchor it in what we don't yet understand. Uh, so, by the way, uh, the God of the gaps has its uh, non-theistic counterpart. You might you call it the no-God of the no-gaps. Darwin's uh, advocate in Germany, Ernst Haeckel, said the cell's component parts properly produce the cell, the soul, and the body of the animated world. With this single argument, the mystery of the universe is explained, the deity annulled. Now, um, I'm not a big advocate of the God of the gaps. Uh, I'm less of an advocate of the no God of the no gaps. Uh, the absence of evidence is certainly not equal to the evidence of absence. So uh, Haeckel didn't have, a, have an argument here. But um, the, the ambiguities in the enterprise of natural theology have caused many people um, to not put much stake in it. And I'm not talking about critics of the Christian faith. I'm talking about Christians themselves. So, Blaise Pascal, for example, um, about almost 400 years, over 400 years ago now, uh, said if the world existed to instruct man of God, his divinity would shine through every part in an indisputable manner. All appearance indicates neither a total exclusion nor a manifest presence of, in, of uh, divinity. Pascal was arguing that the world maybe had divine fingerprints on it, but they were smudged, that there was some ambiguity uh, in nature. And more recently, um, C.S. Lewis said, nature never taught me that there exists a God of glory and of infinite majesty. I had to learn that in other ways. Nature will not verify any theological or metaphysical proposition. Well, what are those other ways? Um, well, let me uh, share some of those ways from the life of this guy. This was me when I was about your age. Uh, <laughs> And like, uh, like John, I fell in love with science uh, when I was in ele elementary school. I wasn't raised in any particular uh, religious tradition. And um, when I got to college, I found uh, the eruption of a number of questions, I mean, at really deep levels, uh, that I didn't think science um, uh, falsified certain answers to. I just didn't think uh, science provided answers one way or another. Uh, why am I here? Uh, what is uh, right and wrong? Is there such a thing as transcendent right and wrong, as moral reality, normative reality? Is there a God? Uh, if there is, uh, does he care about me? And that's why I uh, started out as a major in philosophy. And I have to say that I despaired over the um, ability of uh, scientific reasoning, or for that matter, philosophical reasoning, to answer these questions definitively. And I dropped out of college. Uh, I became a surf bum in Hawaii. And uh, into my life uh, came a man named Bill, as different as I, I was, more than I could imagine. I was a surf bum. He was in the army in Vietnam, in Hawaii on R&R. &R. Uh, I was white, he was black. Uh, I was irreligious. Uh, he was a deeply committed Christian. And he reached across those differences uh, and he loved me, and I recognized something in li Bill's life. He had a purpose for living that I wanted, and I remember thinking, he's either got it or he's crazy. Uh, and I really did think th that he might be wacko. And at the, uh, when it was time for him to go back to Vietnam, he asked me, well, would you like to have the relationship with Christ that I have? And I said, 
Well, if you have it, I'd like it, but I'm not sure you're not crazy, and I'm not sure there is a God. And he said this, well, fair enough. Would you pray with me that if God is real, he'd reveal himself to you, or he'd let you know? I said, sure. Uh, I'm an agnostic, at least. I can pray that if there is a God, he'll let me know. And this is not everybody's experience, but some months later, and this is not everybody's Christian experience, every Christian's experience. I had, uh, I'd never read about uh, such an uh, experience like this, but I have an overwhelming, irrevocably life-changing experience of the manifest presence of a loving God uh, that for me answered those questions. Now you might be thinking, especially those of you who aren't Christians, Well, boy, that's really uh, intellectually irresponsible. Uh, You you say that the evidence underdetermines the answer, and then you have some emotional experience, and that gives you the answer. But that actually brings up the second way in which worldview may interact with science. C.S. Lewis says that I believe in God not only as I believe in the sun, not only because I experience it rising, but because by it I see and understand things. So that um, worldview, religious and otherwise, can inform science by increasing the background beliefs that influence the reservoir of uh, plausible hypotheses for investigation. That is to say, now John said in his presentation, he um, tries not to let presuppositions uh, unduly influence or blackmail his science. I think we all do. But we're all humans and presupposition, all presuppositions do at least this. They influence uh, the prior uh, plausibility we assign to particular hypotheses. And the job of the responsible intellectual is to recognize those overtly. So it might be something like this for the religious believer. It might be, I haven't dug up treasure uh, that infers, implies there's a pirate. I actually met one. Seven's to be my, one of my son's favorite movie. So, uh, I've met a pirate. You recognize him, right? Uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. And uh, this pirate has told me where there's some treasure and I'm going to go digging for it. So it might be that religious commitments give us a sense of what true, what's true and then we can use the tools of science to go digging. Now we have to be very careful to obey uh, the constraints that John suggested. We can't use science, uh, to, uh, we, we can't sift scientific data to prove our conclusions. We have to use the same tools that everybody else uses. And by the way, lest you think this is just uh, an idiosyncratic and merely religious way of interacting uh, between science and worldview, here's what the Nobel laureate Francois Jacob said. To produce a valuable observation, one has first to have an idea of what to observe, a preconception of what is possible. And scientific advances often come from looking at objects from a different angle. This look is necessarily guided by a certain idea of what the so-called reality might be. It always involves a certain conception about the unknown, that is, about what lies beyond that which one has logical or experimental reasons to believe. So that's a starting point for investigation. But then we've got to dig, and we have to dig honestly, and we have to be honest about what we come up with and what we don't come up with. And that's one of the reasons I love the idea of a university. If you can get people with different starting pre-commitments, all digging, and all sitting at a table together saying, this is what I dug up today, uh, without acrimony, without mistrust, without vilification, uh, so much the richer uh, for the intellectual enterprise of figuring out what makes the world tick. So how would this uh, relate to the issue of altruism? Well, different starting pre-commitments. The theologian uh, Soren Kierkegaard, who also lived during the time of Darwin, says one must believe in love. Otherwise, one will never become aware that it exists. On the other hand, more recently, just at UCSB, um, the biologist Garrett Hardin starts with the opposite pre-commitment. We must start with the assumption of pure self-interest. And if this is wrong, we'll find out. Now, even more specifically, how would the Christian faith inform investigations about altruism? And I want to suggest, uh, and these are just reservoirs of hypotheses. There are at least three that follow from, if the Christian faith is true, at least three things have to be true about altruism. First of all, it better exist. Uh, In contrast to a statement by an evolutionary biologist colleague, scratch an altruist, watch a hypocrite bleed. No hint of genuine charity ameliorates our vision of society once sentimentalism has been laid aside. Secondly, 
altruism not only has to be exist, but in some way it has to be a refrain of human flourishing. In contrast uh, to the view, for example, uh, that evolutionary biology is quite clear that what's in it for me is the ancient refrain of all life. Now, maybe in some way this, these, could be, these could both be true, uh, but this can't be the only truth about life. And secondly, maybe more, most controversial, faith in and experience of a loving God are conducive to altruism. Um, now, let me be very careful in saying, uh, if these things are true, they don't demonstrate that the Christian faith is true. It's the opposite. If the Christian faith is true, these things uh, would follow. In fact, by the way, it's not even the case that um, these hypotheses only emerge from Christian commitment. So I have two colleagues in evolutionary biology who spent many years working on uh, altruism um, and who I've been privileged to collaborate with on several projects, David Sloan Wilson and Dominic Johnson. Um, in their own way, they would affirm the three propositions that I just mentioned, uh, but they're atheists. Now, in their view, altruism exists. It's related to human flourishing and religion is capable of promoting altruism, but they think religion is false and so it's a useful fiction uh, in their view. Uh, and in my view, it's not a fiction, uh, but we would each affirm those three propositions. Now, what about those propositions? In terms of the, what do we know about the evolution of altruism? Uh, first of all, what is it? And I want to distinguish altruism from cooperation here. Um, th this is a table from a recent paper by um, uh, the psychologist Mark Hauser. And the, the simplest distinction, and it actually it isn't this simple. Uh, John has an elegant paper where he points out there are other ways of construing altruism in terms of cost. But um, what most evolutionary biologists want to explain uh, is, is the distinction between cooperative behavior where both the donor and the recipient gain and altruistic behavior where the recipient gains at cost to the donor. How can we explain this? Well, the first thing is I'm going to jump over some... Uh, interesting slides of the increase of cooperativity uh, across major uh, evolutionary transitions. Uh, and as fascinating that is, that doesn't get us to altruism. Um, altruism, if it really involves the conferral of benefit to another at cost uh, to the actor, at face value this has to be true. Michael Gisel again. If natural selection is both sufficient and true, it's impossible for a genuinely disinterested or altruistic behavior pattern to evolve. So um, although that's true at face value, it turns out that we've had some breakthrough proposals uh, from evolutionary theory of two different kinds. Uh, the original breakthrough proposals um, were kin selection. Uh, John already mentioned this. There's a lot we could say about kin selection, except for the most apt phrase that uh, I've heard is... Um, uh, attributed to the biologist uh, J.B.S. Haldane doodling on a pub in a napkin one night where he says, I'll gladly jump in the river for two brothers or eight cousins. Uh, actually, when I first saw that cited, it was two brothers and four cousins, uh, and the textbooks have been manicured since then. Uh, but if it, Haldane would have made a mistake if it was four cousins because our index of genetic relatedness to cousins is only 0 0.125. But in any case, the, what, what kin selection does is um, it dramatically reformulates the notion of fitness, actually, from a property of individual organisms to a property of genes. And kin selection got a lot of work done. In fact, uh, in the book that I began my uh, talk with uh, by E.O. Wilson, where he says that altruism is the great theoretical problem in uh, sociobiology, the very next sentence he goes on to say, but kinship explains it. Um, but kinship doesn't explain all of it because organisms make uh, costly investments in non-kin. And so reciprocal altruism was developed by Bill Hamilton and, and refined by Robert Trivers, which basically says uh, that I'll be willing to invest in John if the, the um, probability of a return from him times the benefit uh, more than compensates for my investment. So powerful or seemingly powerful were these two proposals that at, um, a generation ago we thought that would do all the work in explaining uh, all apparent altruism. By the way, what both of these ultimately say is that uh, genetically any acts which conform to these acts may represent costly investments, but they're not net costs. 
they're uh, more than reciprocated uh, in the organism's fitness. So ultimately, actually, they're not altruistic. And E.O. Wilson says, uh, leaves us with this, this uh, delightful dilemma that human beings have achieved an extraordinary degree of cooperation with little or no sacrifice of personal survival. How he alone has been able to cross this pinnacle, reversing the downward trend of social evolution in general, is the culminating mystery of all of biology. So in ensuing years, there's been a flourishing of what you might call second generation proposals. And most of these proposals actually refer uh, specifically and uniquely to human beings uh, of three different kinds. One of them, and um, this is my term, it might not be a very good one, but you might call uh, one group uh, fuzzy reciprocity. Uh, it's situations of costly investment where the individual isn't thinking in strictly recipro reciprocal terms. Uh, so uh, maybe I'm going to be nice to Mary, who introduced me, but I, I'm really not sure she's going to pay me back. How could that happen? Uh, well, one proposal is indirect reciprocity, where Mary doesn't pay me back, but you sitting in the first row, you see me do it. You think I'm a good guy, and if I'm in uh, need sometime, you're going to pay me back based on my reputation. In fact, um, let me do a thought experiment with you. Let's say um, somebody says, uh, I'll give you $100 if you can pass an undergraduate final exam in, in uh, evolutionary theory. And um, this guy will tutor you if you pay him 10 bucks out of your own pocket. Would you pay him 10 bucks to tutor you? And you're thinking, well, how do I know whether I'd pay him 10 bucks? I've never met him before. But now I tell you this. Um, his name is David Haig. He's got a, a university distinguished chair in the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology at Harvard. And now most of you, I think, would pay David Haig 10 bucks to uh, tutor you in evolutionary biology. You've never met him, but you know something about him reputationally. And in fact, the reason I chose David Haig is because he came, he came up with this wonderful little phrase to convey um, indirect reciprocity. He says, reciprocal altruism takes a face. That is to say, it takes the ability to recognize individuals and remember who's paid us back and reneged on us. Indirect reciprocity takes a name. It takes the uniquely human adaptation of language and the ability to communicate fidelity or defection. Uh, verbally. But that's not the only uh, me mechanism of fuzzy reciprocity. We might also think of friendship in terms of fuzzy reciprocity. Many people describe friends as um, just a reciprocal relationship where I do something for my buddy if he'll do something back. But actually, and uh, in a really, really wonderful paper by uh, John Tooby and his wife uh, Lita called Friendship and the Banker's Paradox, they point out that to the extent that we maintain scrupulous reciprocity to that very extent, we're probably not friends. That friendship uh, involves something... Um, I, actually, I have to tell you, and John, I'm... I think this is the most elegant paper uh, published on altruism. And it may be a little naive, but if if you can have a favorite uh, academic paper, this is mine. And the reason is, is because I mentioned to you earlier that one of the reasons that um, I got, went through a period of being disenchanted with science is because it didn't seem to attend to the aspects of human life that all of us recognize as real and as important. This particular paper, I encourage you all to read it, um, takes a view of friendship that um, is scientifically rigorous without diminishing in any way what all of us know to be the, the wondrous and beautiful aspects of friendship, which is the fact that we deeply engage with one another without uh, scrupulous monitoring of uh, reciprocal benefits. Now they propose an adaptive reason uh, for friendship, uh, an, a reason that's ultimately adaptive, and in fact, um, we might say, uh, in one sense, um, many friendships alt are altruistic in the sense that they could involve uh, the extension of benefits at cost that never gets repaid. But sh friendship as a phenotypic adaptation, more often than not, uh, must benefit individuals uh, or natural selection couldn't have established it. 
So, uh, and, and furthermore, there are forms of altruism, like uh, rescuing in the Holocaust, that didn't have anything to do with the extension of friendship or personal relationship. So um, this has caused some people to look at, at yet other mechanisms of fostering altruism. Uh, one of them is group selection, and I'm, uh, this is a controversial area, uh, proposal in evolutionary theory, uh, but group selection basically says that there are cer certain members of groups that can um, exhibit behaviors that benefit other group members uh, and where their uh, fitness is actually lowered relative to group members and that evolution can establish that if the variance between fitness within the group is less than the variance between fit, uh, of fitness between groups. You could think of a basketball team where you got paid uh, based on how many points you scored. The person giving the assist is going to make less money. But you still might give assists at the end of the season, the winning team uh, got a bonus. So group selection can actually go a long ways to explaining genuine altruism, but it's only within group altruism, and it must be driven by intergroup conflict. This is what uh, generates what David Sloan Wilson calls the problem of the dark side of group altruism. Um, this act, from the perspective of the in-group, was altruistic. Uh, the terrorists gave their lives uh, for their group. From our perspective, it wasn't altruistic, but this was altruistic. However, if you read, um, there was a big banner that they took down, I think, but the first few days of 9-11 at Ground Zero, there's a big banner that said 5,000 reasons to kill them all. Um, so again, on both sides, uh, the, the manifestation of tremendous sacrifice on behalf of the group, and tremendous outgroup hostility. So I've just been through the major explanations of altruism. Are we left with anything that could explain radical outgroup altruism uh, on the basis of biology? Uh, and it's an issue of huge debate these days, but there are many biologists who say no. I'm not talking about critics of evolution, I'm just talking about biologists. Um, in fact, the proposal is that maybe for humans, and only humans, there are uh, replicating uh, units of information or, or there, are, um, there are factors that influence and inform human behavior that don't reduce the genes, which, which uh, in, is cultural information. So uh, Bill Durham at Stanford University has written a wonderful book on co-evolution of genes and culture, and he argues that culture and, and genetic uh, may interact in, in many different ways. They can be mutually reinforcing or they can be oppositional. Sometimes cultural information can actually override our genes or, uh, or inform behaviors in a way that aren't in our genetic self-interest. Uh, Joseph Laprido says this, uh, speaking of religion actually, he talks about conceptions of a cultural nature that thwart the self-serving thrust of the gene, whereby some humans are led to subordinate their genetic fitness and their self-interest in general to the fitness and interest of others, even strangers who are in no position to reciprocate. And Richard Dawkins takes it a step farther. He says uh, at the end of the selfish gene, he says um, that we have the power to defy the selfish genes of our birth, cultivating and nurturing a pure disinterested altruism, something that has no place in nature and something that has never existed before in the whole history of the world. We alone on earth can rebel against the tyranny of the selfish replicators. By the way, um, this affirmation of dramatic human uniqueness is actually uh, stronger than many Christian theologians would affirm. And I'll close with just a few comments on this notion of human uniqueness. Um, it's controversial amongst biologists. Um, and first of all, what it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that if humans are unique, it's necessarily supernatural. It could be, actually, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. It doesn't mean biologically transcendent, that there's something about human beings which is completely uncoupled from their biologies, and it certainly doesn't mean moral superiority. Uh, and by that I mean if, if, if there is something about humans that enables them to do uh, something that other organisms can't do, that could be dramatically moral, uh, uh, and we call that in terms of social exchange, altruism. It could be dramatically immoral, we call that spite. Uh, where you hurt somebody just for the sake of hurting them, even though it doesn't benefit you at all. 
Um, the primatologist Franz de Waal is strongly opposed to the notions that I just uh, conveyed to you, that somehow ideas, inc including and especially religious ideas, could transform who we are. Uh, and de Waal argues that, well, shoot, at the very point that the question of what humans are becomes most interesting, you throw in the towel biologically and try to explain it by something that's non-biological. And de Waal wants to argue that uh, morality isn't just uh, some sort of veneer that we put on a basically selfish biology, but that it comes out of our biology. And actually, as a Christian, I'd want to meet him halfway on that. Uh, the most ancient view of morality in the Christian tradition called natural law theory, and this comes out of a statement that Jesus said when he said the, the law was made for man and not man for the law. That is to say, whatever morality is, uh, it's a, a recipe for... Uh, fulfilling most deeply who we're made to be. But morality can't come only out of what we're inclined to do. Otherwise, we'd have no reasons for morality. So uh, DeWall says, it's the rare claim of human uniqueness that holds up for more than a decade. We have no basic wants or needs that cannot also be observed in our primate relatives. He goes on to say, like us, they strive for power, enjoy sex, want security and protection, want their territory. Um, well, we might ask, is that all human beings really want? And uh, the developmental psychologist, uh, this has been a fascinating debate in the recent literature, Jerome Kagan at Harvard. He and DeWall have had a give and take uh, in recent years. Kagan says the continual, he says, no, we do have uh, fundamental wants and desires that differ. The continual desire to regard the self as good is a unique feature of homo sapiens although it has a firm foundation in the human genome. So he's not arguing for transcendence. Uh, it's part of who we are genetically, but it's unique. It is not an obvious derivative of the competence of apes and monkeys. Our biologically prepared biases render the human experience incommensurable with that of any other species. Now, um, let me really uh, close by just saying I invite you to talk about... Um, altruism and faith uh, in the question section, but I want to close with this quote uh, from Blaise Pascal again. Uh, Pascal says, the God of Christians is not a God who is simply the author of mathematical truths or the or order of the elements. The God of Christians is a God of love and of comfort, a God who fills the soul and the heart of those he possesses, a God who makes them consciousness of their inward uh, wretchedness, we might say neediness now, and his infinite mercy who unites himself to their inmost soul and who fills it with humility and joy, with confidence and love, and who renders them incapable of any other end than himself. Thanks very much for your attention. Look forward to your questions. Uh, this is for Dr. Schloss. To what extent do you think that social pressures and culture affect the needs that humans have beyond what is explained by natural selection? Well, I think the, um, the fundamental contours of human, the human mind, which includes um, the way we mentally process social inputs and the way that we feel, uh, I am a Christian who believes that those were shaped by natural selection. So, um, in, in one sense, uh, I would say that it depends what you mean by beyond natural selection. So, in one sense, I would say that whatever human responses are to culture, uh, the range of capacities to respond have been shaped by natural selection. Um, however, there are elements of culture which weren't uh, envisioned uh, uh, by natural selection itself and which weren't um, in force uh, during the time that the human mind was shaped. So it's imminently conceivable that um, human beings do all sorts of things um, that not only weren't envisioned by natural selection but don't necessarily have selective value because of the construction of um, environments which every phenotype is a gene by environment interaction. And humans construct environments uh, which didn't exist uh, at the time that human beings were formed. Um, the evolutionary psychologist Henry uh, Plotkin uh, um, suggests, therefore, that, that 
this can mean good news uh, for human beings that we can do we can lavish attention and love into uh, all sorts of things that might not have direct uh, ad, um, reproductive value. And it can also mean bad news, that human beings can create environments uh, at which our fundamental cognitive adaptations are not at home, uh, and which rather than cause human flourishing can cause uh, human atrophy and impoverishment. It's directed to me, but this that's that's a better phrase than I would have I would have made the same answer and less less elegantly. So. Uh, my follow-up question is: Do you think these structures that you say are not necessarily selective are increasing in frequency uh, in current times, or are staying at a level plane, or even decreasing in frequency? Consider uh, in relation to our past. Well, you're asking me what, me what I think. I think that they are increasing, but I don't necessarily think that that is bad news because how most of us construe um, human flourishing, um, it, it's not completely unrelated uh, to the selective forces which created the human mind and, and fitness, but it, in fact, isn't um, completely constrained by that. So, for example, if you look at modern cultures, most people have less babies uh, than they could maximally have. Uh, so fitness is not being maximized in, in human cultures. Uh, most of us live longer than is rep uh, re strictly re reproductively efficacious. Uh, many of us make uh, radical sacrifices in and investments for things that don't loop everything from um, ideas or art or endangered species uh, or suffering people in the, in the third world. So um, I think it's increasing, but I don't think that that's bad news. It's a reflection of this marvelous, um, almost totipotency that human beings have in the range of possible behaviors. The challenge is, is um, to whatever extent uh, our behaviors are not merely constrained by our biology. The central tendencies, if you look at the average behaviors, the, uh, I think they make great biological sense. It's the range which is so amazing. And the challenge is to make sure that um, we exercise our freedom uh, to expand that range in a direction that increases flourishing uh, rather than degrades flourishing. And um, it, my own beliefs is, um, I, I, that um, that's something in my own experience where uh, my faith in Christ has been both instructive uh, and influential and, and motivating. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. So traditionally, um, like humans have believed that morality has come from above, but both of you, to an extent, say that morality comes from below, as in evolution, uh, survival to the fittest. So should we base our morality primarily on the greater good? And if not, should, um, what role does science have in understanding and applying morality? Since he answered last time, the answer I would have given uh, let me first uh, answer on his behalf, maybe, and then on my own. Uh, uh, okay, which is that I'm not sure that uh, Jeff would necessarily think that uh, with a transcendent God, there would ne be necessarily a bifurcation between morality being caused from below and being caused from divine processes. But uh, anyway, that's my guess of what I understand from it. Uh, but, but anyway, uh, from my own not being theistic myself, uh, yes, so this is a core problem. Uh, you put your finger on a core problem uh, for non-theists like me, which is that at the heart of Darwinism, uh, from a moral point of view, there's a certain kind of nihilism, uh, which is to say that, uh, so there's, uh, so I talked about Langer's um, and you know, uh, natural selection for murder of infants, which is about as horrible a thing as we can think of, right? And, and from the point of view of natural selection, not that it has a point of view, but the process of natural selection will favor things which uh, cause in a certain ecological situation an increase in frequency, okay? Sometimes that will be things that we as humans or we as 
uh, you know, humans in developed liberal democracies think are good things. And sometimes uh, we'll, they'll be like, you know, love of family, for example. Uh, and other times there'll be things that we think are bad things. So I, for example, personally think that there are certain predispositions for thinking and feeling uh, which are involved in the formations of coalition, formation of coalitions for the purpose of aggressing against other coalitions. So that, that, to put that in shorter terms, that there are some kinds of temptations to engage in warfare which are, part, which are not just a cultural process that I'm operating on a blank slate, but are part of the features of the human mind. So if you go into toy stores, okay, you'll see a whole wall which is, you know, conquer the galaxy or, uh, you know, doors versus orcs or, you know, and that the specifics of it are highly different, are, are highly individual uh, or chess, okay. But the underlying principle of it is a zero-sum relationship between two groups over some resource, um, which often involves death or removal from the game, okay? It's a kind of thing which happens all around the world. Uh, we play competitive sports, which are game versions of these things, okay? So that would be a bad thing, that natural selection, people, it, that might not be true. Uh, it's my, my personal belief and our research in this area might not be well-founded, but if it were true, it's a possible to be a true thing, that natural selection has predisposed humans to have some interest under some circumstances in warfare. Um, uh, that would be a bad thing, right? And so, uh, so where does that leave you from the point of view? Well, if, our, if we have preferences that are a result of natural selection, and some of these preferences lead to human suffering, and some lead to or are consistent with our local values, and others are not, um, there's no higher platform within the causal physics universe from which to judge those things, okay, and say that uh, the Aztec, uh, the Aztec cannibalistic human sacrifice is not a better way of being than my, it's not what I, we could say it's not to my taste, right, but can we say it's really better, okay. And there isn't, I would say it's a cultural problem that we don't have uh, within traditional uh, Western religious traditions, there was such a platform, and we are living off of the stored capital of that in terms of social organization. But if somebody seriously arises and says, we have a different proposal, um, and our proposal is, you know, Kali death worship or something, there's nothing, we could say, well, factually, we don't think there's a goddess Kali, but there's no scientific basis for saying that that's a bad thing because and this goes back, this is not new news, this is from uh, David Hume, who, you know, to my mind, uh, effectively uh, argued that you can't derive an ought from an is. So science is about what is, and we cannot derive from science, therefore, a moral system, okay? Uh, we still have our personal moral systems and our responses. And so this is a civilizational process because morality within a group used to depend upon the notion that it was shared and somehow validated a, a, an objective kind of thing. Uh, and uh, so we now have, you know, lots of different moral systems that are, that we're attempting to have coexist in the same society. But, uh, you know, um, so honor killings, for example, men who kill their daughters because their daughters are dating. Uh, and because uh, that's a, a shame and, you know, uh, I'm, from their point of view, and therefore they say, I ought not to be punished for this, this is a good thing, right? Um, and uh, so it's a, it's a cultural problem. Um, and uh, so that's the bad news for, from a physics slash Darwinian viewpoint. Uh, One of the great things about a dialogue like this is uh, it presents the chance to get to know each other. You actually, you are, you're, that is what I would say. Uh, so. Uh, but I'd, I'd say two other things very quickly. Um, and the, actually, I, I, I don't, the first thing is this. I love your question, uh, great question. I would want to nuance it in the following two ways. First of all, the, the traditional view isn't really only that morality comes from above. And let me give you an example of what I mean. In both Jewish and, and Christian traditions, um, they don't, um, they don't construe uh, toddlers as morally responsible yet. 
uh, there's a sense uh, that somehow the moral sense in human beings emerges uh, out of our own developmental maturing. And so in, in that sense, morality comes from, uh, from below, if you want to think uh, that the development of our organic uh, capacities is below. Now, if you, all, if you believe, um, furthermore, that the v very um, ability to develop moral capacities is itself a product of a, of a longer developmental process over evolution, um, I would just say that's, in a sense, the same thing. Just as uh, toddlers start out as pre-moral creatures, still of, of great worth, but not morally responsible, um, so it is that moral sentience itself may have emerged, uh, emerged over the process of life's history. What the Christian, uh, as opposed to the non-theist, would believe, though, is that, that this process ultimately reflects the sculpting uh, and the design uh, of a wise and, and ultimately moral being. So that you and I are constituted to develop a moral sense that's capable of recognizing morality uh, as God intended it to be recognized. But here's the second thing. And the second thing is um, that um, there's a difference between saying uh, the content of morality evolved, it may or may not have, versus the capacity to make moral judgments is a, is a function of minds which have evolved. That latter is a, a more modest proposal. Uh, the capacity to make moral judgments, um, and there may be moral, uh, and but the moral judgments that people make may change over time, and in fact, I think they have. I think they've changed uh, uh, culturally uh, uh, over the period of, of human history. I take that to be in part a reflection of God's engagement with humanity, which includes, by the way. Uh, not just uh, the conveyance of moral propositions, and here's a unique and very um, controversial claim about the Christian faith. Um, God isn't just a lawgiver. Um, th that, in fact, the true moral life consists in recognizing failure and uh, receiving forgiveness, uh, and not only forgiveness, but empowerment. Now, that's a wild claim, and it could be a false claim. But most Christians would say that the ultimate relevance uh, of God to their moral life is not just a philosophical foundation for meta-ethics, but in fact uh, it entails the context of, of um, being able to start again when we've made moral, uh, been subjected to moral failure and being empowered to live up to ideals that we think on our own uh, we don't have the capacity to reach. And you could believe all of that and still, still believe that the fundamental aspect of the human mind which recognizes moral propositions is organically instantiated. If I could uh, uh, just add one thing to what I said, which is uh, you talked about utilitarianism. Uh, and I think as a, no, not speaking as a moralist, of which I'm not well qualified, uh, and maybe nobody's well qualified, but just speaking as a scientist, I would say that to the extent there is going to be, uh, if secular humanism were a uh, belief system that spread and became common, uh, then uh, my guess is that utilitarianism would be the easiest and most appealing kind of uh, agreed moral, agreed basis for foundation for morality just because uh, people have a certain amount of power. So if you were to, uh, you know, and everybody has some power and also lots of people empathize with other people. And that what seems to follow from that is that the social negotiation that would happen would be uh, uh, something approximating utilitarianism. And uh, however, as a strict, as, as an intellectual proposition, so Sam Harris apparently thinks I haven't read his new book, but I saw some sort of brief, and we have some sort of brief talk on the basis of it, but he's, he thinks that you can derive utilitarianism from science. A lot of my friends, a lot of people think that. I, I personally don't think that's possible, but I, I wouldn't be, I'm not myself a pure utilitarian, but uh, it's a lot better than, you know, Kali death worship or any of the infinite number of other things um, uh, that there could be. Um, but lots of people don't agree with that. So, for example, um, certain, uh, certain uh, fraction of 
Uh, Muslims don't think in utilitarianism. They think they have a whole complicated theology-based viewpoint in which uh, the good is not defined that way. And uh, uh, so uh, it's a problem. Thank you. This, uh, we're going to go on with five more minutes with questions. So five more minutes, and then we're going to have a five-minute wrap-up from each of our speakers. So we're almost done. This question is for Dr. Schloss. Sorry for pronouncing that wrong. Um, kind of touched on what you said before. How do you explain that, in your opinion, um, the moral shortcomings, as you described, of 2,000 years ago, the biblical times, seem to be condoned by a God who should have perfect morals? So I think, I think what you said is if you look at the, the uh, past of religious traditions or the biblical traditions, there's a lot of stuff that we would view as morally repugnant now. I mean, you, you used the more benign term, shortcomings. Uh, and how would I explain the fact that they appeared to be condoned by a God who's a morally perfect being? Correct, yes. Yeah. Well, um, there are a lot of different responses to that view. I don't know, um, I, I think it's a hard question, and I don't know uh, that any single response is um, entirely uh, satisfactory, but I'll, 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 I'll tell you uh, several responses that come from within the Christian tradition. Uh, and um, the, the first response is this. Um, this actually comes from the words of Jesus himself uh, when he, um, uh, argued against divorce and he said but it has not always been so due to the hardness of your hearts uh, God has accommodated you so um, one view in the Christian tradition is that God uh, although um, he is a morally perfect being um, he works within the historical constraints of uh, humanity another statement uh, of Jesus that Jesus made to his disciples was this he said I have more to say to you, but you cannot bear it at this time. Um, so that um, in God's moral perfection um, constructed a moral ideal to which he was uh, equipping uh, humanity to conform to over history. But that in fact, in the earlier stages of history, uh, humanity was not able. Uh, and part of the, that equipping evolved. This gets back to the question that the first person asked is that um, humans are shaped not only um, um, uh, intrinsically by their genetics, but um, who we end up to be is shaped by our cultural context. And there's certain things we just are incapable of, perhaps may have been incapable of, of different, uh, at different stages of history. And conjoined to the comment that I just made, uh, m many Christians uh, believe that what looks morally aberrant to us now actually in the context of history was a moral step forward. And I'll give you one example of that. The Old Testament gives prescriptions for vengeance. It says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Uh, Gandhi famously said in a, um, in a world where everybody lived by that maximum, we'd all be uh, blind and toothless. Uh, so um, we actually thankfully ha have come culturally to the point um, where vengeance isn't a moral ideal. But the time that that particular uh, moral command was implemented, that was actually a constraint on vengeance. Uh, what happened before that was seven, the, the, the ideal was sevenfold uh, vengeance. If you injure me, I will injure you back sevenfold. So um, these are imperfect answers, but uh, many Christians believe those two things, that God works with human beings uh, and works with you, with each one of us in the context uh, of, of where we are. Uh, and secondly, uh, what appears to be uh, morally suboptimal to us now, um, we, we shouldn't do jingoistic history, that in the context that was actually a step forward in terms of moral ideals. Thank you. It's actually 10 o'clock, so I think it's, I, I apologize, I think we need to cut the questions off at this time, and I'm going to ask Dr. Tooby if he would take the first five minutes and just wrap up with the conclusion, and then Dr. Schloss will do the same. Dr. Tooby? So uh, one thing I, I didn't say, uh, but had meant to say, was that uh, we humans are fortunate uh, in our evolutionary history uh, 
uh, in the following sense that there are many species that end up in ecologies where uh, social interactions are extremely ruthless and are only ruthless and exploitive. Um, so uh, I talked about conflict in the womb. Uh, certain sharks, uh, before they're uh, born, uh, the larger ones eat inside the mother, the smaller ones, right, for example, um, and uh, uh, which is, so when people say Darwinian, it's often a, a term they use to mean uh, this world, in, a, a world in which things are completely ruthless, dark, hostile, and exploited. So I can't remember if it was G. Gordon Liddy inside prison, but he said in prison you learned what Darwinism really is, and, and he's meaning Darwinism in that highly incomplete sense, okay. Uh, but uh, the good news from evolutionary biology uh, is that, I mean, there have been cynics before there was Darwin um, and people who took a dark view of the world before there was Darwin, that, that recent developments in evolutionary biology uh, suggest that there are, that, you know. So when I was growing up, the view was that people were intrinsically bad and that only socialization gave them morality. Uh, and uh, gave them altruism, gave them empathy. And that was a view that was commonly held. And with modern evolutionary biology and modern evolutionary psychology, I would say we now, it might be an overstatement to say we now know, I think we now know, that uh, in, intrinsic to the structure of natural selection in certain environments, under certain conditions, altruism can be uh, a designed feature of our of human nature uh, is a designed feature of human nature, and that we had a fortunate evolutionary history in the sense that we, as hunter gatherers, uh, we interacted with people we were related to, uh, and we interacted with people who were our friends and uh, who we cooperated with, and who we re reared children with together, and for that reason, having two uh, exploitive a relationship with people in your own group was something that was by and large selected against. So we have this, uh, I would say we have at a certain level a predisposition to cooperate and a predisposition to put at least some weight on other people's uh, welfare. Um, it's also the case though that these are contingent and so out group members or uh, in situations where there's sometimes important uh, things at stake, people are quite willing to be ruthlessly exploitive and if you look at human history, there's, you know, people will keep slaves, people will exterminate uh, those who are on territory they want, um, uh, and we don't have to go back in time. And, you know, 20th century was full of uh, extremely dark uh, explo human exploitation. Uh, so anyway, but that's not the whole story, that we do have these capacities in us, and they come from a particular evolutionary history. If we'd had a different evolutionary history, uh, you know, uh, organisms with different evolutionary histories are much less, you know, kind, much less empathetic, much less cooperative, much less altruistic than humans are, okay? Um, and so, uh, but then there's this, again, this cosmic meta question, which is, well, so, so what? Is it better to be altruistic? And, well, yes, that's my preference. That's probably your preference too. Um, but the universe doesn't say it's better. It just says it's caused. Okay. Um, so. Well, first of all, thanks for, uh, for welcoming us. I guess I'd like to close with uh, two quick points. Uh, the first one, I've uh, been uh, citing Pascal a lot tonight, but I'd like to uh, cl close with a little aphorism by Blaise Pascal. He says, man is neither angel nor brute. And the unfortunate thing is, and then what comes next is kind of surprising, he says, he who would act the angel acts the brute. What he means by that is this, um, or what, it, what he might mean by that uh, in our current context uh, is this. Um, I don't think that natural selection uh, or the maximization of fitness explains everything there is to explain about human beings 
and uh, nor does animal models of, of social behavior explaining, explain everything there is about human beings. Um, we're, we're not, we, we don't have no differences, double negative intended, with animals. Um, but we do have biological continuity with other creatures. And Pascal's warning is, it might be dangerous for us to think that we are only capable of the same uh, social behaviors that animals have. No, we're capable of, um, of much more lofty uh, desires and behaviors. But it's, all, but it's equally dangerous if we want to lead good lives, um, to be uncognizant of the fact um, as he says, he who would act the angel acts the brute. If you, want, if you think that you don't have any biological constraints or, or an inducements to awful behavior, uh, you're more likely to exhibit that behavior. The scriptures themselves say, um, there is forgiveness with you because you know our frame that we're but dust. Um, we ought not think too highly of ourselves, uh, nor too lowly. And the second comment is this. Um, John has shared with me personally, and he actually m mentioned tonight, that um, a thoroughgoing evolutionary view of the world, in some respects, um, has a nihilistic tinge to it. And I, I guess I want to say I, uh, I agree with that, and I, and I don't agree with that. Um, the, the world is... is um, Boy, if we're looking at the world only for evidence and manifestation of some wondrous, unabated, undiluted goodness, we're going to be disappointed. Uh, of course, it didn't take evolution um, to reveal that. The world's a messy and in many respects an ugly place, and evolution has further illuminated that. Although it also contains manifest uh, wonder and goodness. Uh, the question is, um, does it point to something beyond the world that's ultimately good. And if you start with the preconception that um, there is no such thing, then I actually think that those who argue uh, for evolution being uh, an illuminator of nihilism are, are, being, uh, are intellectually honest and right. But especially for those Christians in the audience, uh, evolution doesn't have to be a nihilistic um, theory about how the world works. If first of all we understand the constraints on uh, what it doesn't explain, that doesn't mean it's false, but no scientific theory explains everything. And secondly, if we understand the world and all the laws and principles which govern its uh, or order its behavior as reflections of something beyond the world, then it doesn't have to be nihilistic. Uh, and in fact it can be the opposite, it can be faith um, enhancing. So those are my two points. Uh, I want to thank you, but I mostly want to say what a pleasure it is uh, to be in a personal and an academic environment where we can have these conversations cordially. I think it's a real model for how the university ought to work. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you all very much for making it tonight. Can we give one more big round of applause to Dr. Harrison, Dr. Cross, and Dr. Judy? For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.